Good evening and happy Thor's Day to you all. Robert, son of Irvin, here again to share with you stories from Neil Gaiman's Norse mythology. Tonight, we will learn of where the king of the gods, Odin, received his wisdom, where the mighty Thor, warrior of the gods, received Mjolnir, his magic hammer, and other gods and goddesses received wondrous magical items from the dwarves. Mimir's Head and Odin's Eye. In Jotunheim, the home of the giants, is Mimir's Well. It bubbles up from deep in the ground and it feeds and draws all the world tree. Mimir, the wise one, the guardian of memory, knows many things. His well is wisdom, and when the world was young, he would drink every morning from the well by dipping the horn, known as the Gjallar horn, into the water and draining it. Long, long ago, when the worlds were young, Odin put on his long cloak and his hat and in the guise of a wanderer, he traveled through the land of the giants, risking his life to get to Mimir to seek wisdom. One drink from the water of your well, Uncle Mimir, said Odin. That is all I ask for. Mimir shook his head. Nobody drank from the well but Mimir himself. He said nothing. Seldom do those who are silent make mistakes. I'm your nephew, said Odin. My mother, Besla, was your sister. That is not enough, said Mimir. One drink. With a drink from your well, Mimir, I will be wise. Name your price. Your eye is my price, said Mimir. Your eye in the pool. Odin did not ask if he was joking. The journey through giant country to get to Mimir's well had been long and dangerous. Odin had been willing to risk his life to get there. He was willing to do more than that for the wisdom he sought. Odin's face was set. Give me a knife, was all he said. After he had done what was needful, he placed his eye carefully in the pool. It stared up at him through the water. Odin filled the Gjallar horn with water from Mimir's pool and he lifted it to his lips. The water was cold. He drained it down. Wisdom flooded into him. He saw farther and more clearly with his one eye than he ever had with two. Thereafter, Odin was given other names. Blinder, they called him, the Blind God, and Barar, the One-Eyed, and Valig, the Flaming-Eyed One. Odin's eye remains in Mimir's well, preserved by the waters that feed the world ash seeing nothing, seeing everything. Time passed. When the war between the Aesir and the Vanir was ending, and they were exchanging warriors and chiefs, Odin sent Mimir to the Vanir as an advisor to the Aesir god Honir, who would be the new chief of the Vanir. Honir was tall and good-looking, and he looked like a king. When Mimir was with him to advise him, Honir also spoke like a king and made wide decisions. But when Mimir was not with him, Honir seemed unable to come to a decision, and the Vanir soon tired of this. They took the revenge not on Honir, but on Mimir. They cut off Mimir's head and sent it to Odin. Odin was not angry. He rubbed Mimir's head with certain herbs to prevent it from rotting, and he chanted charms and incantations over it, for he did not wish Mimir's knowledge to be lost. Soon enough, Mimir opened his eyes and spoke to him. Mimir's advice was good, as it was always good. Odin took Mimir's head back to the well beneath the world tree, and he placed it there, beside his eye, in the waters of knowledge of the future and of the past. Odin gave the Gjallar horn to Heimdall, watchman of the gods. On the day the Gjallar horn is blown, it will wake the gods no matter where they are, no matter how deeply they sleep. Heimdall will blow the Gjallar horn once at the end of all things at Ragnarok. The Treasures of the Gods Thor's wife was the beautiful Sif. She was of the Aesir. Thor loved her for herself and for her blue eyes and her pale skin her red lips and her smile, and he loved her long, long hair, the color of a field of barley at the end of summer. Thor woke and stared at sleeping Sif. He scratched his beard, then he tapped his wife with a huge hand. What happened to you? he asked. She opened her eyes, the color of the summer sky. What are you talking about? she asked, and then she moved her head and looked puzzled. Her fingers reached up to her bare pink scalp and touched it, exploring it tentatively. She looked at Thor, horrified. My hair, was all she said. Thor nodded. It's gone, he said. He has left you bald. He? asked Sif. Thor said nothing. He strapped on his belt of power, Nadian Jord, which doubles his enormous strength. Loki, he said. Loki has done this. Why do you say that, said Sif, touching her bald head frantically, as if the fluttering touch of her fingers would make her hair return? Because, said Thor, when something goes wrong, the first thing I always think is, is it Loki's fault? It saves a lot of time. Thor found Loki's door locked, so he pushed through it, leaving it in pieces. He picked Loki up and said only, why? 
Why what? Loki's face was the picture of perfect innocence. Sif's hair, my wife's golden hair. It was so beautiful. Why did you cut it off? A hundred expressions chased each other across Loki's face, cunning and shiftiness, truculence and confusion. Thor shook Loki hard. Loki looked down, and did his best to appear ashamed. It was funny. I was drunk. Thor's brow lowered. Sif's hair was her glory. People will think that her head was shaved for punishment, that she did something she had not have done, did it with someone she'd not have. Well, yes, there is that, said Loki. They will probably think that, and unfortunately, given that I took her hair from the root, she'll probably go through the rest of her life completely bald. No, she won't. Thor looked up at Loki, whom he was now holding far above his head with a face like thunder. I'm afraid she will, but there's always hats and scarves. She won't go through life bald, said Thor, because, Loki, Laufey's son, if you do not put her hair right back now, I am going to break every single bone in your body, each and every one of them, and if her hair does not grow properly, I will come back and break every bone in your body again, and again, if I do it every day, I'll soon get really good at it, he carried on, sounding slightly more cheerful. No, said Loki, I can't put her hair back, it doesn't work like that. Today, mused Thor, it will probably take me about an hour to break every bone in your body, but I bet that with practice I could get it down to about 15 minutes. It will be interesting to find out. He started to break his first bone. Dwarfs, shrieked Loki. Pardon? Dwarfs, they can make anything. They can make golden hair for Sif, hair that would bond with her scalp and grow normally perfect golden hair. They could do it, I swear they could. Then, said Thor, you had better go and talk to them and he dropped Loki from high above his head onto the floor. Loki clambered to his feet and hurried away before Thor could break any more bones. He put on his shoes that had let him travel through the sky, and he went to Svaltalfheim, where the dwarves have their workshops. The most ingenious craftsmen of it all, he decided, were the three dwarves known as the Sons of Vivaldi. Loki went to their underground forge. Hello, Sons of Vivaldi. I have asked around, and people here tell me that Brock and Atri, his brother, are the greatest... Dwarf craftsmen there are or have ever been, said Loki. No, said one of the sons of Ivaldi. It's us. We're the greatest craftsmen there ever are. I'm sure that Brock and Eitri can make treasures as good as those you can. Lies, said the tallest of the sons of Ivaldi. I wouldn't trust those fumble-fingered incompetents to shoe a horse. The smallest and wisest of the sons of Ivaldi simply shrugged. Whatever they make, we can do better. I hear that they've challenged you, said Loki. Three treasures. The gods of the Aesir will judge who made the best treasure. Oh, and by the way, one of the treasures you need you make needs to be hair. Ever growing perfect golden hair. We can do that, said one of the sons of Vivaldi. Even Loki could barely tell them apart. Loki went across the mountain to see the dwarf called Brock at the workshop he shared with his brother Atri. Vivaldi's sons are making three treasures as gifts for the gods of Asgard, said Loki. The gods are going to judge the treasures. If all these sons want me to tell you that they are certain you and your brother can't make anything as good as they can. They called you fumble-fingered incompetence. Brock was no fool. That smells extremely fishy to me, Loki, he said. Are you sure this isn't your doing? Stirring up trouble between Atri and me and in Evaldi's boys seems like the sort of thing you do. Loki looked as guileless as he could, which was amazingly guileless. Nothing to do with me, he said innocently. I just thought you ought to know. And you have no personal stake in this, asked Brock. None whatsoever. Brock nodded and looked up at Loki. Brock's brother, Atri, was the great craftsman, but Brock was the smarter of the two and the more determined. Well, then, we'll be happy to take on the sons of Vivaldi in a test of skill to be judged by the gods, because I have no doubt that Atri can forge better and craftier things than Vivaldi's lot. But let's make this personal, Loki, huh? What do you have in mind? asked Loki. Your head, said Brock. If we win this contest, we get your head, Loki. There's lots of things going on in that head of yours, and I have no doubt that Atri can make a wonderful device out of it. A thinking machine, perhaps, or an inkwell. Loki kept smiling, but he was scowling on the inside. The day had started out so well. Still, he simply had to ensure that Atri and Brock lost the contest. The gods would still get six wonderful things from the dwarves, and Sif would get her a golden hair back. He could do that. He was Loki. Of course, he said. My head. No problem. Across the mountain, the sons of Ivaldi were making their treasures. Loki was not worried about them, but he needed to make sure that Brock and Atri did not 
could not possibly win. Brock and Atri entered the forge. It was dark in there, lit by the orange glow of burning charcoal. Atri took a pigskin from a shelf and placed it into the forge. I've been keeping this pigskin for something like this, he said. Brock just nodded. Right, said Atri. You work the bellows, Brock. Just keep pumping them. I need this hot, and I need it consistently hot, otherwise it won't work. Pump. Pump. Brock began to pump the bellows, sending a stream of oxygen-rich air into the heart of the forge, heating everything up. He had done it many times before. Atri watched until he was satisfied they would all be to his liking. Atri left to work on his creation outside the forge. As he opened the door to go out, a large black insect flew in. It was not a horse fly, and it wasn't a deer fly. It was bigger than either one. It flew in and circled the room in a malicious way. Brock could hear the sound of Atri's hammer outside at the forge, and the sounds of filing and twisting, of shaping and banging. The large black fly, it was the biggest blackest fly you've ever seen, landed on the back of Brock's hand. Both of Brock's hands were on the bellows. He did not stop pumping his sword at the fly. The fly bit Brock hard on the back of the hand. Brock kept pumping. The door opened and Atri came in and carefully pulled the work from the forge. It appeared to be a huge boar with bristles of gleaming gold. Good work, said Atri. A fraction of a degree warmer or cooler and the whole thing would have been a waste of our time. Good work you too, said Brock. Atri took a block of gold and placed it on the forge. Right, he said. This next one will impress them. When I call, start pumping the bellows, and whatever happens, do not slow down or speed up or stop. There's fiddly work involved. Uh, got it, said Brock. Atri left the room and began to work. Brock waited until he heard Atri's call, and he started to pump the bellows. The black fly circled the room thoughtfully, then landed on Brock's neck. The insect stepped aside daintily to avoid a rivulet of sweat, for the air was hot and close in the forge. It bit Brock's neck as hard as it could. Scarlet blood joined the sweat on Brock's neck, but the dwarf did not stop pumping. Atri returned. He removed a white hot arm ring from the forge. He dropped it into the stone cooling pond in the forge to quench it. There was a cloud of steam as the arm ring fell into the water. The ring cooled, moving rapidly to orange, to red hot, and then as it cooled, to gold. It's called Drop Near, said Atri. The Tripper? That's a funny name for a ring, said Brock. Not for this one, said Atri, and he explained to Brock what was so very special about the arm ring. Now, said Atri, there's something I've had in mind to make for a very long time now. My masterwork, but it's even trickier than the other two, so what you have to do is pump and don't stop pumping, said Brock. That's right, said Atri, even more than before. Do not change your pace or the whole thing will be ruined. Atri picked up an ingot of pig iron, bigger than any ingot that the black fly, who was actually Loki, had ever seen before, and he hefted it into the forge. He left the room and called out to Brock to begin pumping. Brock began to pump, and the sound of Atri's hammers began as Atri pulled and shaped and welded and joined. Loki, in fly shape, decided there was no more time for subtlety. Atri's masterpiece would be something that would impress the gods, and if the gods were impressed enough, he'd lose his head. Loki landed between Brock's eyes and started to bite the dwarf's eyelids. The dwarf continued to pump, his eyes stinging. Loki bit deeper, harder, more desperately. Now blood ran from the dwarf's eyelids into his eyes and down his face, blinding him. Brock squinted and shook his head, trying to dislodge the fly. He jerked his head from side to side. He contorted his mouth and tried blowing air up at the fly. It was no good. The fly continued to bite, and the dwarf could see nothing but blood. A sharp pain filled his head. Brock counted, and at the bottom of the downstroke, he whipped one hand from the bellows and swapped at the fly with such speed and such strength that Loki barely escaped with his life. Brock grabbed the bellows once again and continued to pump. Enough, called Atri. The black fly flew unsteadily about the room. Atri opened the door, allowing the fly to escape. Atri looked at his brother with disappointment. Brock's face was a mess of blood and sweat. I don't know what you were playing at that time, said Atri, but you came close to ruining everything. The temperature was all over the place at the end. As it is, it's nowhere near as impressive as I'd hoped. We'll just have to see. Loki, in Loki shape, strolled in through the open door. So, all ready for the contest? He asked. Brock can go to Asgard and present my gifts to the gods and cut off your head, said Atri. I like it best here at my forge, making things. Brock stared at Loki through swollen eyelids. I'm looking forward to cutting off your head, said Brock. It got personal. In Asgard, three gods sat on the thrones, one-eyed Odin, the All-Father, rare-bearded Thor of the Thunders, and handsome Frey of the Summer's Harvest. They would be the judges. Loki stood before them beside the three almost identical sons of Ivaldi. 
Brock, black-bearded and brooding, was there alone, standing to one side, the things he'd brought hidden beneath sheets. So, said Odin, what are we judging? Treasures, said Loki. The sons of Ivaldi have made gifts for you, great Odin, and for Thor, and for Frey, and so have Eitri and Brock. It's up to you to decide which of the six things is the finest treasure. I myself will show you the gifts made by the sons of Ivaldi. He presented Odin with this spear called Dungnir. It was a beautiful spear carved with intricate runes. It will penetrate anything, and when you throw it, it will always find its mark, said Loki. Odin had but one eye after all, and sometimes his aim could be less than perfect. And, just as important, an oath taken on this spear is unbreakable. Odin hefted the spear. It's very fine, was all he said. And here, said Loki proudly, is a flowing head of golden hair made of real gold. It will attach itself to the head of the person who needs it and grow and behave in every way as if it were real hair. A hundred thousand strands of gold. I'll test it, said Thor. Sif, come here. Sif rose and came to the front, her head covered. She removed her headscarf. The gods gasped when they saw Sif's naked head, bald and pink, and then she carefully placed the dwarf's golden wig on her head and shook her hair. They watched as the base of the wig joined itself to her scalp, and then stood, Sif stood in front of them, even more radiant and beautiful than before. Impressive, said Thor. Good job. Sif tossed her golden hair and walked out of the hall into the sunlight to show her new hair to her friends. The last of the sons of all these remarkable gifts was small and folded like cloth. This cloth Loki placed in front of Frey. What is it? It looks like a silk scarf, said Frey, unimpressed. It does, said Loki, but if you unfold it, you'll discover it's a ship called Skidbladner. It will always have a fair wind wherever it goes, and although it's huge, the biggest ship you can imagine, it will fold up, as you see, like a cloth so you can put it in your pocket. Frey was impressed, and Loki was relieved. They were three really excellent gifts. Now it was Brock's turn. His eyelids were red and swollen, and there was a huge insect bite on the side of his neck. Loki thought Brock looked entirely too cocky, especially given the remarkable things that all these sons had made. Brock took the golden arm ring and placed it in front of Odin on his high throne. This arm ring is called Dropnir, said Brock, because every ninth night, eight gold arm rings of equal beauty will drip from it. You can reward people with them or store them, and your wealth will increase. Odin examined the arm ring, then pushed it onto his arm up high on his biceps. It gleamed there. It is very fine, he said. Loki recalled that Odin had said the same thing about the spear. Brock walked over to Frey. He raised a cloth and revealed a huge boar with bristles made of gold. This is a boar my brother made for you to pull your chariot, said Brock. It will race across the sky and over the sea faster than the fastest horse. There will never be a night so dark that its golden bristles will not give light and let you see what you're doing. It will never tire and it will never fail you. It is called Golden Bursty, the Golden Bristled One. Frey looked impressed. Still, thought Loki, the magical ship that folded up like a cloth was every bit as impressive as an unstoppable boar that shone in the dark. Loki's head was quite safe. And the last gift Brock had to present was the one that Loki knew he'd already managed to sabotage. From beneath the cloth, Brock produced a hammer and placed it in front of Thor. Thor looked at it and sniffed. The handle's rather short, he said. Brock nodded. Yes, he said, that's my fault. I was working the bellows. But before you dismiss it, let me tell you about what makes this hammer unique. It's called Mjolnir, the lightning maker. First of all, it's unbreakable. Doesn't matter how hard you hit something with it, the hammer will always be undamaged. Thor looked interested. He'd already broken a great many weapons over the years, normally by hitting things with them very hard. If you throw the hammer, it will never miss what you throw it at. Thor looked even more interested. He had lost a number of otherwise excellent weapons by throwing them at things that irritated him and missing, and he'd watched too many weapons he'd thrown disappear into the distance, never to be seen again. No matter how hard or how far you throw it, it will always return to your hand. Thor was actually now smiling, and the Thunder God didn't often smile. You can change the size of the hammer. It will grow, and it will also shrink down so small that if you wish, you can hide it inside your shirt. Thor clapped his hands together in delight, and thunder echoed across Asgard. And yet, as you have observed, concluded Brock, sadly, the handle of the hammer is indeed too short. This is my fault. I failed to keep the bellows blowing while my brother Atri was forcing it. Ah, the shortness of the handle is a minor cosmetic problem, said Thor. This hammer will protect us from the frost giants. It's the finest gift I've ever seen. It will protect Asgard. It will protect all of us, said Odin with approval. 
If I were a giant, I would be very afraid of Thor if he had that hammer, said Gray. Yes, it's an excellent hammer, but Thor, what about the hair? Sif's beautiful new golden hair, asked Loki, slightly desperately. What? Oh, yeah, my wife has very nice hair, said Thor. Now, show me how to make the hammer grow and shrink, Brock. Thor's hammer is better even than my wonderful spear and my excellent arm ring, said Odin, nodding. The hammer is greater and more impressive than my ship and my boar, admitted Frey. It will keep the gods of Asgard safe. The gods clapped Brock on the back and told him that he and Atri had made the finest gift that they had ever been given. Good to know, said Brock. He turned to Loki. So, said Brock, I get to cut off your head, Laufey's son, and take it back with me. Atri was so pleased. We can turn it into something useful. I will ransom my head, said Loki. I have treasures I can give you. Atri and I already have all the treasures we need, said Brock. We make treasure. No, Loki, I want your head. Loki thought for a moment and said, Then you can have it, if you can catch me. And Loki leapt high into the air and ran off, far above their heads, and in moments he was gone. Brock looked at Thor. Can you catch him? Thor shrugged. I really shouldn't, he said, but then I would very much like that to try out the hammer. In moments, Thor returned, holding Loki tightly. Loki was glaring with impotent fury. The dwarf Brock took out his knife. Come here, Loki, he said. I'm going to cut off your head. Of course, said Loki. You can, of course, cut off my head. But, and I appeal to mighty Odin here, if you cut off any of my neck, you are violating the terms of our agreement which promised you my head and my head only. Odin inclined his head. Loki's right, he said. You have no right to cut his neck. Brock was irritated. I can't cut off his head without cutting his neck, he said. Loki looked pleased with himself. You see, he said, if people thought through the exactness of their words, they would not dare to take on Loki, the wisest, the cleverest, the trickiest, the most intelligent, the best looking. Brock whispered a suggestion to Odin. That would be fair, agreed Odin. Brock produced a strip of leather and a knife. He wrapped the leather around Loki's mouth. Brock tried to pierce the leather with the tip of the knife blade. It's not working, said Brock. My knife isn't cutting you. I might have wisely arranged for protection from knife blades, said Loki modestly, just in case the whole you can't get my neck ploy didn't work. I am afraid no knife blade can cut me. Brock grunted and produced an awl, a pointed spike used in leather work, and he jabbed it through the leather, punching holes through Loki's lips. Then he took a strong thread and sewed Loki's lips together with it. Brock walked away, leaving Loki with his mouth sewn up tight, unable to complain. For Loki, the pain of being unable to talk hurt even more than the pain of having his lips stitched into the leather. So, now you know, that is how the gods got their greatest treasures. It was Loki's fault. Even Thor's hammer was Loki's fault. That was the thing about Loki. You resented him even when you were at your most grateful, and you were grateful to him even when you hated him the most. Thank you, and next week we will return with more myths, and I hope to see you then. Good night.